Good day everyone, I'm Dr. Lahari here and uh, today we'll be continuing the second part of this important lecture series on uh, red and white lesions of the oral mucosa. Dr. Ajay and myself will be pitching in uh, wherever required to uh, discuss details of the various diseases that we will be talking about in this topic. The learning outcomes as discussed earlier would be to categorize the causes of red and white lesions uh, and to differentiate them clinical pathologically and uh, explain oral potentially malignant disorders which uh, has been covered in the part one of this uh, lecture series <clears throat> and explain the etiopathogenesis, clinical features, histopathology, diagnostic workup, differential diagnosis and management of all of these lesions so which we will be covering one by one. Uh, to illustrate the histopathology of various grades of epithelial dysplasia and identify the importance of grades of epithelial dysplasia in a histopathological report and choose the appropriate treatment options. So uh, most of these learning outcomes would be um, combined together uh, depending on the uh, particular disease that we are looking at. The appearance of the oral mucosa as stated earlier is um, either white or red. Now we're not talking about any other variations in color in this topic uh, like for example when there is a pigmentation which could be either due to melanin or other sources but in specific when there is a white lesion or white appearing lesion it could be because of hyperkeratosis or acanthosis uh, due to abnormal but benign thickening of the stratum spinosum or due to accumulation of fluid either in the intracellular or extracellular uh, components or necrosis or due to pseudomembrane which is generally caused by fungi. But when there is a red lesion, it could only be because of atrophic epithelium or increased vascularization. So that's the reason why you actually see the appearance of a white versus a red lesion. To classify the red and white lesions of the oral mucosa based on etiology, uh, I have used here the one proposed by um, Burkitt's Oral Medicine, which categorizes it based on infections, immunopathologic diseases, potentially malignant lesions, uh, allergic reactions, toxic reactions, reactions to mechanical trauma, and other red and white lesions. So we will be talking about um, diseases based on this uh, classification and covering the most important ones under each of these headings. Discussing about infections causing red and white lesions, the two most important examples that we have discussed here are candidiasis, which we have discussed in detail, and uh, hairy leukoplakia. Right, let's look at oral candidiasis first. It's the most common opportunistic infection. It's called as a disease of the diseased. That means that uh, is there, if there is an underlying condition, you're more likely to manifest with uh, oral candidiasis. 35% of population, uh, all of us exhibit candida in the oral cavity as normal flora. And 50% of denture wearers have denture stomatitis, which is one of the most common uh, causes <clears throat> or one of the most reasons why there is uh, candidiasis in the oral cavity. So predisposing factors for oral candidiasis is, is not, it's difficult for a healthy person to uh, exhibit oral candidiasis as a disease. The general reasons why uh, candidiasis is seen, it could be because of local factors like there's denture wearing, smoking, uh, atopic constitution, inhalation steroids, topical steroid use, hyperkeratosis, imbalance in the oral microflora, quality and quantity of saliva. Systemic factors would be immunosuppressive disease, impaired health status, uh, immunosuppressive drugs, chemotherapy, endocrine disorders or any hematinic which means blood deficiencies. So classification of oral candida candidiasis, you are already familiar with this, is just either a primary lesion or a secondary lesion. The primary one is uh, in, limited to the oral and perioral regions, where the secondary one is associated with systemic manifestations as well. So the primary ones uh, is the one we'll be concentrating more on. It could be the acute uh, oral candidiasis or chronic oral candidiasis. Now the acute ones could be pseudomembrane or erythematous, also called as atrophic. And chronic could be in the form of pseudomembrane, erythematous again plaque like or nodular and then there are candida associated lesions these happen because of a mixture of candidal and bacterial organisms 
together causing the problem in the oral cavity. The examples for these would be dentist dermatitis, angular chelitis, and median rhomboid glossitis. Under the secondary one, there are various uh, diseases. Again, these are uh, divided into, uh, you know, <clears throat> diseases which are associated with endocrinopathy or mucocutaneous candidiasis or diseases like HIV. Let's go to pseudomembranous candidiasis, also called as oral thrush. Um, this is a picture of a 56-year-old female patient on dialysis with neglected oral cavity, appears weak and anemic. And there are large areas of white scrapable lesions which leave pinpoint erythema upon removal. Now, this is one of our patients whom we had seen uh, many years ago. If you've noticed that there's a lot of white areas seen in the oral cavity, you would assume that to be food debris, which is natural differential diagnosis, but it's actually oral thrush, which is pseudomembranous candidiasis. And this patient, um, in fact, had some underlying condition because of which there was uh, pseudomembranous candidiasis seen. This is erythematous candidiasis and now there's an interesting terminology called as kissing lesion that's written out here. Erythematous candidiasis again can be patchy or diffuse uh, or restricted to one particular area. Here we are seeing two areas which is the tongue as well as the uh, palate involved. Um, the reasons again could be an underlying condition or a local um, uh, disturbances like for example smoking or because of uh, uh, usage of antibiotics for a very long time um, and, and in here you would see that the palate actually is in contact with the tongue most of the time so that's the reason why if there's a lesion starts off on the tongue it's very likely that it, uh, uh, it it spreads to the palate or if the lesion starts off on the palate it can spread to the tongue and that's the reason why it's called as a kissing lesion because the palate and the tongue are supposed to be in close contact to each other Chronic plaque type and nodular uh, candidiasis, uh, this is also called as candida leukoplakia. There is believed to be a role of candida in malignant transformation of this lesion and that's the, why, that's the reason why it's called as candida uh, leukoplakia. Now if you look at this, this doesn't look uh, normal at all. There is a superficial pseudomembranous candidiasis along with, uh, uh, you know, um, a raised lesion which you're seeing here uh, which could be you know associated with plaque like areas plaque like candidiasis as well as you know a raised area nodular area a and this is uh, suspicious for developing leukoplakia in it and uh, should be biopsied dentist stomatitis very common lesion i'm not going into the classification of dentist stomatitis you're pretty familiar with this but there are three types minor uh, erythema or restricted to few areas only diffuse erythema in type 2 and type 3 which is shown in the picture here diffuse erythema and granular palatal mucosa you know a raised granular appearance uh, typically restricted to the denture bearing area so like I mentioned previously, dentist stomatitis is a candida associated lesion. So there is a combination of both fungal as well as bacterial organisms which lead to this kind of appearance of the oral mucosa. Angular chelitis, this is again uh, a candida associated lesion. It can happen because of candida as well as staphylococcus aureus. I've written the short form here, which is um, in high abundance on the skin surface. So 30% uh, of dentist stomatitis cases also have angular chelitis. There are various reasons to why the person develops angular chelitis in the first place. It could be due to vitamin deficiency, iron deficiency anemia, or simply due to lot of loss of vertical dimension. When we talk about loss of vertical dimension, we mean that uh, in the elderly uh, patients who have lost their teeth, there is a tendency for the uh, arches to collapse and because of lack of teeth and hence there is drooling from the angles of the mouth and that's why it leads to angular chelitis. Right, uh, moving on, uh, look at this case, it's a 34 year old Caucasian male who is a heavy smoker and he comes with an asymptomatic lesion. Now, where is the lesion? The lesion is on the dorsum of the tongue here, which you're seeing, uh, erythematous area on the tongue, not normal. Uh, it could be called as erythematous candidiasis, but it is by having a specific terminology called as median rhomboid glossitis. So the diagnosis of uh, candida in the oral cavity, oral candidiasis can be done by various methods. Generally, uh, the organism will have to be cultured to make a specific diagnosis. There are various methods of <clears throat> culturing the organism. It could be a smear or a scrape, imprint, impression cultures or salivary culture or simply biopsy if you're suspecting features of dysplasia. So this is a 
a method of candle isolation i picked this uh, uh, chart from uh, burkitts you can go through it where it talks about how to do the specific step and what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing it in your clinic so many of these could be uh, chair side and some of them might need uh, uh, it to be transmitted to the lab to understand how to uh, what is the uh, you know kind of colony forming units that you're seeing and anything about 50 it says here for example in imprint culture is a sign that there is a, you know a candidal infection okay so coming to the lab diagnosis of oral candidiasis uh, now that you've understood the clinical presentation uh, you were, you've understood how uh, candida candidiasis presents in the oral cavity so let's look at uh, how will we do what will you do in terms of uh, lab diagnosis to confirm our diagnosis of, of candida okay so first of all uh, we will um, use sterile swabs to to scrape off the the whitish lesions in the oral cavity and then send it to the lab so when you do this uh, sample collection uh, you can do something called as a KHOH uh, potassium uh, hydroxide wet mount which is uh, done which can be done instantly this is something that is done only on skin lesions uh, not from lesions in the oral cavity what we do in terms of lesions from the oral cavity is we send this swab off to the lab wherein they actually do the pass staining okay so pas is per iodic acid ship staining which is a special stain that helps us to identify the hyphae and the spores okay so this picture here this mini picture here that you see is actually a picture of a smear from uh, a lesion like this wherein you're seeing this epithelial slime epithelial cell and you're able to see the hyphae and the spores over here additionally the same swab can also be uh, used to 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 identify the organism by doing fungal culture wherein they use the saberos dextrose agar uh, medium to to grow the right so for you to understand here if you have uh, a patient like this okay that is identified as candida leukoplakia when we do a biopsy uh, when we do a scrape first of all we will be able to see uh, images similar to the previous slide as i just showed you but when you do a biopsy that means a tissue section that is taken then when it is stained by paradoxic shift staining we will be able to see hyphae uh, that are that are you know, seen in the superficial layers of the epithelium okay so long standing long standing uh, candidial infection can lead to uh, hyperplastic candidial uh, lesions uh, in the oral cavity okay which is also described as candidial leukoplakia okay thank you so uh, the management of candidiasis first of all local factors should be taken care of now when we talk about local factors we we go back to the predisposing factors that we spoke about smoking uh, an ill-fitting denture or someone who's not taking off the dentures at night time so th those kind of factors which need to be eliminated fungals antifungals they come uh, uh, very handy um, the examples uh, you remember from uh, pharmacology would be polyenes. These are like example amphotericin B or nystatin oral suspensions. Uh, generally, they are not absorbed from GI tract and usually the uh, person does not develop uh, resistance to this. So, or you could have azoles in the form of cotrimazole, myconazole, ketoconazole. So, these, these are tablets and these are uh, gels which are available. In fact, in our clinic, uh, we have cotrimazole and myconazole available, uh, commonly used in the management of oral candidiasis. And chlorhexidine, a mouthwash which has mild antifungal activity. It's a, it is also, um, it's an antimicrobial and quite effective in dealing with mild uh, uh, oral infections where you're suspecting a combination of both fungal and bacterial uh, infection in the oral cavity so all in all oral candidiasis can be dealt with topical medication first which should be used that is either in the form of lozenges or oral suspensions or a gel or a cream uh, but uh, if in case it is uh, resistant to all of these or stubborn infections which are not uh, uh, you know uh, reducing for more than uh, two weeks then you might want to go on for systemic uh, in a uh, systemic medication right so moving on now we've just 
started off uh, with uh, the diseases where we're talking about infections first. So uh, the first one is a fungal infection which can appear as a white lesion or a red lesion in the oral cavity. The next one is hairy leukoplakia. Now from your third year knowledge, oral pathology knowledge, you're already aware that hairy leukoplakia is actually not leukoplakia. It is uh, an Epstein-Barr virus infection. And whenever the word hairy leukoplakia comes to your co comes to your mind, the first thing that you should uh, remember is this classical appearance of uh, white, uh, non-scrapable lesion seen on the lateral border of the tongue. It could appear in other parts of the tongue, but this is one classical image which should just uh, uh, you know come to your mind first when you think about hairy leukoplakia. Uh, is associated with low levels of CD4 and T4 lymphocytes and hence it serves as a marker of your immune suppression. That means if a person manifests this in the oral cavity and you're suspecting the person to have HIV, then this if, if this subsides after heart treatment, then it is an indication that probably the HIV is, uh, the person is responding to the medication given to HIV. I hope you remember what heart is, highly active uh, antiretroviral therapy. The differential diagnosis for this kind of appearance when it appears in the oral cavity is naturally leukoplakia, plug type of leukoplakia and chronic trauma, trauma which is in the form of morsicatio. I'll, I'll describe this uh, later on, we'll, we'll discuss this later on in the uh, chapter. So this appears completely white and it is non-scrapable. And remember it is not leukoplakia and, and it is not having any malignant potential. It is a viral infection and when the person's immune response improves, it will subside. Next, let's come to the mammoth, which is oral lichen planus. There is uh, a lot to talk about this disease. It, uh, the term lichen actually originates from uh, a symbiotic organism which is composed of algae and fungi. This is a picture of uh, um, oral lichen planus, which is seen on, um, sorry, not oral lichen planus, the term lichen, which is used for these algae or fungi which grow on trees or stones, for example. The etiology of oral lichen planus is uh, largely still unknown. So it is believed to be an immune pathologic uh, uh, lesion with auto reactivation of T lymphocytes. Stress plays a very important component and is also associated with hepatitis C virus. The most important about oral lichen planus is the fact that it is a potentially malignant disorder and hence it needs to be uh, dealt with carefully and the patient needs to be on follow up for a long duration. So 0.5 to 2.2% of the population is affected. If you look at this number, it might seem very small. But uh, <clears throat> as a dentist, it's important for you to understand that uh, many of these patients don't really come to you with the oral lichen planus as the first sign or symptom. And many a time, it is you who are actually diagnosing it uh, in the first time. There's a high female predilection and the mean age is around 55 years. Now, this is uh, around the age of postmenopausal uh, age. So uh, that's why uh, if you notice uh, there's a very high tendency for females to be uh, the patients whom you're likely to see in your clinic. The clinical features of oral lichen planus, there are generally six types of clinical features. Don't confuse them for histopathological features. These are cl classically clinical features, right? So you have both red as well as white appearing oral lichen planus. The they are classified as reticulum or reticular type where you see uh, white striae or in an annular pattern. Papules, which are white, small white dots, also called as papular. Plaque-like, don't confuse for plaque-like um, uh, lichen planus uh, with uh, leukoplakia. That's entirely different. Leukoplakia is a different disorder. We're not talking about it yet. So if you've noticed, I've put the first three in black and the rest in red. There's a reason to this. The bullous, erythematous or atrophic and ulcerative are extremely uh, painful conditions and hence they are symptomatic. The reticular, papular and the plaque-like are generally asymptomatic. Now it's not necessary the patient should always manifest with only one. You could have a combination of all of these at the same time. And it also indicates that the disease is progressing. Now, as a rule, generally lichen planus appears as reticular first and then only, or papular, reticular or papular first, and then only you see the rest of the types. So that means if it's moving from in this direction from white to red, you understand that the disease is progressing or severity of the disease is progressing. 
<coughs> right. So, uh, moving on. Um, let's look at some pictures of how lichen planus appears in the oral cavity. In this, this is a picture of a patient with bilateral reticular form of lichen planus. You can see the striae. You've learned in year three that these are called as Wickham striae. Okay, you can also see that there are reticular form of uh, you know lace-like pattern of white appearance on the lips of this patient. This is the papillar form of oral lichen planus where you see small white dot-like appearance. But somewhere here in the corner, you see that there is also some sort of reticular network-like pattern. Uh, this is a case where you're seeing reticular type, white lines, striae, along with erythematous areas. So there, this, this is uh, an example to show what I just mentioned earlier, that the disease is probably progressing from uh, starting off with white and then progressing with red areas. That means the patient is initially asymptomatic and turns symptomatic later on. Now, how soon will the patient go from white to red, um, or white to mixed, mixed to red is very difficult to say. It could be months or even years. Examples of erythematous lichen planus, you would see that there are white areas and then there is central redness here. Similarly here also central redness with the surrounding white areas. So this is appearance of erythematous lichen planus. Now this is a very interesting terminology, discomative gingivitis. This is not a diagnosis but it's a clinical feature uh, where you see erythematous areas mixed with white striae, erythematous areas mixed with white striae and generally seen on the gingiva, that's why the term discomative gingivitis. The gingiva is sensitive and peels off easily and is extremely painful condition. So the patient comes to you saying that, uh, doctor, I'm not able to brush my teeth. When I brush my teeth, uh, I end up with a lot of pain and I feel that my gums are peeling off. Uh, please help me. What am I supposed to do? Uh, next is ulcerative lichen planus. So you can see that there's a large ulcer here, uh, you know, on the lateral border of the tongue and the buccal mucosa. You will also, if you observe carefully, you will also see that there are some striae seen on the, this part of the tongue and this part of the mucosa here. Some striae here as well. So like I told you, the reticular areas uh, should be visible some part of the oral cavity to call it as oral lichen planus. Otherwise, you can easily confuse this appearance to uh, mm, uh, ulcerative disease had you uh, seen this patient only with ulcers that means you've not seen this patient in the earlier form of the disease but you're seeing the patient uh, in an advanced form of the disease now plaque type of uh, plaque type of lichen planus is uh, very very similar to homogeneous leukoplakia very difficult to make out but one uh, giveaway would be that probably uh, you know the patient could be female or uh, another giveaway uh, a clue to the diagnosis which leads to the diagnosis is the fact that uh, lichen planus is always always bilateral right so this is a case where the plaque type of lichen planus is also developing ulcerative areas if you notice in the corners uh, over here so it's suggesting that it's suggesting disease progression now lichen planus actually is a dermatological disorder there are skin manifestations in 15 percent of cases which start off as oral lichen planus uh, pruritus, erythema, violaceal papules, violaceous means violet, papules and plaques are seen, this is uh, appearance on the skin. There's a very interesting terminology called as Cobner's phenomenon, which uh, means that when the skin gets traumatized, for example, scratching, uh, you end up getting a new lesion, right? It can also happen in the oral cavity uh, because there's constant trauma in the oral cavity during eating, during brushing. Uh, it might just aggravate the oral lichen planus. So does that mean the patients cannot eat and brush? Well, yes, they, they have to be careful while uh, doing that and it could be uh, quite painful. Genital mucosal lesions are also seen in 20% of the women who manifest with oral lichen planus. So it's important to ask the patient if they have symptoms elsewhere. As a dentist, when you're looking at a patient and you're suspecting oral lichen planus, it's important to also ask the patient if they could be having uh, any skin lesions or any genital lesions. So the diagnosis of oral lichen planus to establish clinical diagnosis, it's important to see reticular or papillary lesions. Generally, lichen planus lesions are bilateral. Erythematous lichen planus can occur as discomative gingivitis without white striae. That means it can be completely red gingiva. And in these cases, you might need a biopsy for diagnosis if you are clueless as to why is it so erythematous and you are having other differential diagnosis in mind. Biopsy is important and should be taken from gingival pocket in this kind of situation. But if the lichen planus is on the buccal mucosa, then you would want to take a biopsy from the buccal mucosa. So that's about diagnosis.
Okay, so coming to the histopathology of uh, oral lichen planus, uh, now that you know the uh, clinical features and the presentation, uh, specifically if there is a clinical oral lichen planus, we do advise for a biopsy specifically to rule out, first, first of all to confirm the diagnosis and second of all, uh, we know that uh, lichen planus comes in as oral potentially malignant disorder. Thus, it's mandatory to, for us to do biopsy in order to rule out any pre-malignant changes. Right. So the picture here clearly shows us the um, the histopathology of uh, oral lichen planus. So there are three pathognomic features that we actually see. Number one is hyperparakeratosis. So what do you mean by hyperparakeratosis? It means that there is parakeratinization that is seen on the surface of the epithelium. Okay. So when there is parakeratinization that is seen, basically we do see keratin with remnants of the nuclei. That's why you are actually seeing the bluish dots uh, along with the keratin on the surface over here. Okay. The second feature is sawtooth shaped uh, appearance of retipics. That is, there is pointed, there are pointed ends of the retipics that are noted. If you look at this over here, if you look at this over here, if you look at this uh, as per the arrows over here. And the third most important feature is a subepithelial band or lymphocytic infiltration. So these blue dots that you see here, all these dark blue dots are basically inflammatory cells which are primarily composed of lymphocyte. So these lymphocytes are basically actually attacking the uh, the antigens, the autoantigens in the uh, base, basal layer of cells and thus uh, giving rise to So this is a picture of lichenoid reaction in uh, pointed out in yellow. You can see here that it looks uh, uh, white on the outside, red in the center, and some grayish purple areas here. Very difficult to make out from lichen planus. Looks exactly like lichen planus. Uh, but the only difference here is that there's an amalgam restoration which is on the buccal surface of this uh, molar here and, and another one here which could be the reason why this patient is having a, a lichenoid contact reaction. So the uh, lichenoid spectrum involves oral lichen planus, lichenoid contact reaction, lichenoid drug eruptions and lichenoid reactions of host versus host, graft versus host disease. So we're not going to the entire details of this. What the slide is trying to, in case is getting, aiming to get um, you to understand is that the difference between the two diseases. Right, so when you're talking about treatment of oral lichen planus, our primary aim would be to reduce symptoms of the patient. Right? So it's impossible to completely cure the patient. The only thing that we can do is to reduce the symptoms of the patient. Right? So we still don't have a complete cure for these patients. So if the patient is asymptomatic, we wait and watch. So literally you're waiting for the patient to develop symptoms. And, and that's the, at the matter of fact. Primary treatment of oral lichen planus is steroids. Now, uh, for oral lesions, we always start with a topical steroid and uh, depending on the severity, either in the form of a mouthwash or a gel, minimum of two to three times a day application for at least three weeks. And then you taper the drug for nine weeks. When we were talking about tapering of the drug, I'm taking you back to your pharmacology days, which means that steroid is um, can cause changes to the uh, adrenal cortex, uh, cortex complex. So that's why uh, it's important that when the patient is put on steroids, you need to uh, withdraw the patient from steroids slowly. And that is what is called as tapering of the drug, right? So generally you can't have oral lichen patients, oral lichen planus patients being treated for a few weeks and that's it. They get treated and stop. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, most of the times the patients are on long-term follow-up and they need to be uh, followed up for quite some time to see that the patients don't develop um, any other lesion in the site or the lesion is not progressing further and you would want to see that the patient is symptom free. Uh, parallelly treatment of fungal infection is important uh, because we know that steroids they cause local immune suppression. So uh, when you have local immune suppression and anti-inflammatory action in the oral cavity, there is pain relief, yes, but along with it, the opportunistic infection like candida organisms tend to thrive and grow. So to avoid fungal infection, it's important that you simultaneously treat the patient with fungal uh, infection, for fungal infection so that he or she doesn't develop uh, fungal infections in the oral cavity.
Oral hygiene should be optimized before we start off steroids. So it's a good practice to do a scaling before you actually do uh, put the patient on steroids. But sometimes you're looking at the patient in a situation where he's already very uh, symptomatic and hence you might want to do these simultaneously. Uh, uh, secondary uh, phase of treatment if, if the steroids are not working anymore would be topical cyclophosphamide, tacrolimus and retinoids. Of course, uh, the patient should be medically fit to receive these medications. The uh, most important thing is oral lichen planus is a potentially malignant uh, you know, disorder and hence uh, it has a malignant transformation rate of 0.2%. So it's important that uh, the patient's symptoms are under control and the disease is monitored over a long period of time. Uh, what it actually means is that if in case you are seeing changes, then it's important to take a biopsy. Now. Next is lupus. Now, lupus uh, is going to be covered here as well as under the autoimmune disorders chapter. But let me give you a brief idea about lupus here. This is a multi system autoimmune disease with formation of antibodies um, to DNA and involving immune complexes as well as B and T lymphocytes, leading to vasculitis. So, the primary ailment that happens in lupus is vasculitis. There are various factors uh, which aggravate lupus erythematosus and those are environmental factors such as sun exposure, some drugs, chemical substances and hormones. There is genetic predisposition and generally females of reproductive age, there's 20 to 40 year olds are affected. African, uh, um, the race is more affected than Asians and uh, Caucasians. So uh, lupus is also known as a great mimic because it tends to manifest features which could be similar to many other diseases. Uh, I've just covered this before. The skin is affected in 85% of cases and the common manifestation is a butterfly rash. You could also have renal, musculoskeletal, CNS and cardiovascular involvement. The different types of um, lupus erythematosus, SLE, DLE, acute cutaneous, subacute cutaneous. The most important out of all of this is the fact that it's a potentially malignant disorder when it happens in the oral cavity. As an example of malar rash, which is seen on patient here, is a, a, a typical classical example of a systemic lupus erythematosus rash developing in the malar region of the patient. Right, so SLE, DLE both have similar oral findings. Very difficult to tell you based on the oral findings itself whether you are looking at an SLE or a DLE. You might have to do more investigation to find out the systemic component of the disease. So the, this oral manifestation may be the first sign of the disease. Now that means in 20% of the cases, um, oral manifestations would be the first sign of the disease. That means as a dentist, you have a very high chance of catching this disease early. That is if the patient presents to you. White stri with radiating orientation stop sharply demarcating at the center of the lesion. Central erythema also pre is also present, which is called as brush border appearance. I mean, there's central redness and on the periphery you have white stri. It looks like a brush. So the differential diagnosis for this appearance of the lesion is lichen planus again after sulcer if there is an ulceration present okay so this is an example of how uh, dle looks like central redness with periphery having white areas okay so central redness is looks very typical like a disc that's why the term discoid lupus erythematosus with peripheral white areas so which looks like a brush border appearance right so like a brush border appearance some more pictures again looking very disc like or coin like with brush like white areas at the corner center is mostly red okay, but this one doesn't look like a disc it just looks like a irregular red areas with the little white brush areas and now looking at this disease on this particular case so you can see both sides of the tongue bilateral is very difficult to tell whether this looks like erythematous like in planus or DLE that, and that's what we were trying to that was the point I was trying to get to earlier so now again, this is a case of SLE manifesting as discomative gingivitis, extremely erythematous. Now looking at this, you cannot think of it as simple gingivitis. Neither can you call it as periodontitis. There is looking is so much of erythema of the gingiva and it looks absolutely unexplained, right? So this type of manifestation is called as discomative gingivitis. So again, let me remind you, discomative gingivitis is a clinical finding and not a diagnosis on its own, right? So you could have even SLE, which looks like discomative gingivitis, like in planus, which looks like discomative and gingivitis. And to find out, you will have to do a biopsy. And the best spot to do a biopsy from is somewhere near the pocket area.
Right. There are four more criteria which must be positive in this uh, American College of Rheumatology uh, classification or criteria for SLE. Is there a malar rash, discoid lesion, photosensitivity, presence of oral ulcers, that's the one which we were looking at earlier, non-erosive arthritis of two or more joints, serositis, renal disorders, neurological, hematological or immunological disorders. Right? So, uh, the diagnosis of DLE could be well demarcated cutaneous lesions with scales and follicular plugging, that is malar rash. But in case when you don't have this and oral manifestations is the first sign, then you know that you need to do a biopsy to confirm it. So systemic symptoms, in case of, of management of oral lesion, first of all, systemic symptoms should be treated and symptomatic treatment administered. Again, we go back to topical steroids and immunosuppressive drugs, of course, keeping in mind the opportunistic in, in infections that may occur.